Good afternoon from Jakarta. Welcome to our public discussion titled The Next Chapter of ASEAN and Japan Economic Cooperation in the Post-Pandemic Era. Today's forum is a part of Dialogue for Innovative and Sustainable Growth, DISG, organized by Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, together with Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan, and the IM METI Economic and Industrial Cooperation Committee. It is our great pleasure and honor to host the Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan, His Excellency Koichi Hagyuda in today's event. Welcome, Your Excellency Koichi Hagyuda. We are glad to have you here with us and I hope you have a good time during your visit here in Indonesia. We would also like to welcome Mr. Arshad Rashid, the Chair of Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and also Professor Hidetoshi Nishimura, the President of ERIA. And also welcome to all the participants here that have joined us in this Zoom meeting. Without further ado, to open our session today, I would like to invite Dr. Jinopati Jalal, the founder and the chairman of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia to deliver his opening remarks. Dr. Dino, you may have the floor. Thank you, Jenny. And hello to everybody. This is Dino Pati Jalal. I'm founder of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. Uh, which is the largest foreign policy group in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia. I want to wish everybody Happy New Year. I hope uh, you're having a happy holiday. Uh, I'm still actually in the midst of my holiday somewhere in Eastern uh, Indonesia, which is why I'm looking a lot darker than usual because I've been sailing for so many days and uh, I'm not being able to find a, a suit like everyone else. I'm uh, not even a tie because uh, for some reason it's hard to find a suit and, and, and tie uh, in, in this place. Uh, but uh, I, I want to uh, uh, say hello to uh, um, uh, Minister for Economy, Trade and Industry, um, uh, Mr. Koichi Hagiuda. Uh, I want to say hello also to um, uh, Chairman of Kadin uh, uh, Arshad Rashid, uh, to uh, the head of uh, area, uh, Mr. Nikki uh, uh, Nikimura, uh, uh, and also uh, I want to say uh, hello to all our speakers. Uh, 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 sorry, I'm losing my notes here. Uh, uh, to to our speakers. Uh, Fukunari Kimura and uh, Nuki Akia uh, uh, Utama, right? Uh, and, and again, uh, uh, hello to Professor Hidetoshi uh, Nishimura. Yeah, it's, it's great for all of you to be, to be here. And uh, today uh, we're going to hear an important policy announcement by uh, Professor ha Haigyuda. And I look forward to hearing what those uh, announcements uh, will be. And uh, I think we all agreed that uh, this is going to be a very consequential year for uh, the region and in the midst of uh, really rapid geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, changes that are happening uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific and especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, it is uh, quite interesting uh, to know uh, what will be the future of ASEAN-Japan uh, relations. And I believe from the speech that will be made, uh, by uh, Minister Hagyuda, uh, I think uh, we will all uh, be reassured that the future of ASEAN and the future of Japan will be bound together. And I think uh, it is also clear that uh, ASEAN and Japan uh, in the coming decades uh, will be even closer and stronger as uh, partners. Uh, you know, I belong to a generation that remembers very well uh, about Japan, uh, Godzilla, uh, Sony, and Toyota, right? Uh, those are the icons of uh, uh, Japan in, in my life, uh, I think in the life of millions of others in Indonesia and in, in Southeast Asia. And definitely uh, uh, those icons tell a lot of stories about how Japan has become part of Southeast Asia's uh, growth uh, and, and progress uh, in, in recent decades. And certainly, um, um, no matter how you see the uh, evolution of world affairs and regional affairs, uh, Japan is definitely here to stay. Uh, Japan is one of the most consequential powers uh, in the region uh, with lots to offer. Uh, and uh, how Japan sees uh, 
uh, how it will contribute to the region uh, through the policy initiatives that will be announced by Minister Hayuda, uh, I think will be of enormous interest uh, to all of us. So uh, with that said, again, I want to say uh, uh, thank you to uh, Eria, uh, to Meti for being our partner in organizing our events today, where we have over a thousand people from 50 countries. And uh, I look forward to what I know will be a great uh, discussion by all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dino. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Arshad Rashid, the chair of Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry to deliver a remark. Mr. Arshad, you may have the floor. Excellencies. His Excellency Koichi Hagyuda, Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan. Dr. Dino Patijala, Founder and Chairman of Foreign Policy, Community of Indonesia. And Excellency Professor Hidetoshi Nishimura, President of Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure and honor to address this distinguished audience today in today's virtual dialogue on innovative and sustainable growth in the post-pandemic era. Diplomatic relations between Indonesia and Japan have been established for 64 years since 1958 and have flourished into one of East Asia most robust diplomatic relationship despite the global threat posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our bilateral relationship has kept a good momentum of development with consolidated mutual trust which both countries are greatly benefiting from. This is reflected in the Indonesia-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. The two countries are also working and finalizing the negotiation on the general review of the Japan Economic Partnership or IJPA to ensure future strategic economic cooperation that can be further strengthened. Ladies and gentlemen, We've been, or we've seen a promising trend of trade values between Indonesia and Japan up until 2020, when the pandemic has significantly affected bilateral trade and investment cooperation. Indonesia, Japan, two-way bilateral trade has reached only more than 24 billion in 2020, down almost 23 percent from 2019. And Japan's investment in Indonesia also decreased from 4.3 billion US dollars in 2019 to 2.58 billion dollars in 2020. However, during the pandemic, Indonesian goods, including footwear and clothing, automotive spare parts, biomass, fish products, and cocoa are winning more confidence in the Japanese market. This contributes to the significant increase in Indonesia's threat surplus with Japan, which reached 2.9 billion US dollars. On investment cooperation, Japan became the third largest foreign investor in Indonesia. Currently, Indonesia and Japan remain committed to pushing forward the development of priority infrastructure projects with a particular focus on the MRT, Pandiban Port, and North Java Railway project. Kadin hopes we can attract more investors to invest in Indonesia in 2022, especially in the area of digital and creative economy, technopreneurship, as well as the development of human resources or human capital in the manufacturing sector through digital engineering 4.0. In the sustainability context, Indonesian and Japanese governments have committed to achieving net zero by 2060. Kadin believes 
This can open up more investment opportunities for Indonesia and Japan in renewable energy sectors such as solar energy, electric vehicles, and other low-carbon-based development projects, including ecotourism as an effort to move towards a green economy and sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, Kadin is strongly confident that the new Indonesian law, what we call as Cipta Kerja or the Job Creation Law, which is created as an omnibus law in the previous year, will serve its purpose to improve the ease of doing business and therefore brighten the investment climate in Indonesia. Kadin will continue to support and enhance the resilience of Indonesia-Japan's economic partnership through collaboration with policymakers and business partners, as well as becoming a B2B bridge that will strengthen the bilateral relationship between the two countries. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude my speech today, I would like to invite everyone in this webinar to actively participate in today's dialogue. Hopefully, from this discussion, we can come up with some new business ideas to help accelerate the economic recovery and strengthen the economic and investment partnership between Japan and Indonesia. With that, I would like to say thank you, stay healthy, and stay safe. Thank you, Mr. Arshad, for the remark. Next, I would like to invite Professor Hidetoshi Nishimura, the president of the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, to deliver a remark. Professor Hidetoshi, the floor is yours. His Excellency, <clears throat> Mr. Koichi Hagiuda, Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan. Dr. Dinopati Jalal, founder and the chairman of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, FPCI. Mr. Arshad Rashid, chairman of Indonesia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Kadin. His Excellency, Nuki Agyautama, executive director of ASEAN Center for Energy and Professor Fukunari Kimura, our chief economist of area. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good morning and evening uh, anyway to you all. Firstly, allow me to express my sincere gratitude to all of you for participating in the public forum on the next chapter of ASEAN and Japan economic cooperation in the post-pandemic era. As one of the organizers, I would like to thank FPCI and METI Japan for co-organizing this important event. For today's forum, we have invited esteemed speakers to discuss the future landscape of ASEAN-Japan cooperation. And we are also very honored and fortunate today that we can receive the precious keynote speech by Minister Hagiuda. Minister Hagiuda visited Indonesia and area on the Japan Indonesia 60th anniversary of the diplomatic relationship in January 2018. I hope that. Today's keynote speech will be a significant milestone in the relationship between the two countries as well as ASEAN in terms of promoting development and sharing prosperity in the future. The COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted our society, but has also forced us and indeed provided us with a great opportunity to rethink our ways of doing business and our lifestyles. We have come to realize that 
commuting to workplace is not always necessary, and that online meeting connect people quickly as easily, even if they live in different countries, like this webinar from more than 50 countries' audience. E-commerce has never been more common in our daily life. The COVID-19 pandemic ignited the momentum towards digital transformation, but a recent survey by ADA showed that only a limited number of firms choose digitalization measures against the disruption of supply chains by COVID-19. Therefore, we need effective policies to achieve further digitalization. We have also seen a significant change in the moment of the green transition, the Glasgow Climate Pact. The result of COP26 last year is, above all, explicitly committed to reducing the use of coal. ASEAN member states need to pursue low carbon energy transition towards carbon neutrality, taking into to account each country's significant different national circumstances. At the 20th AEC Council meeting last year, ASEAN adopted the framework for circular economy for the ASEAN economic community. We are at a historical turning point. ASEAN, I believe, has the greatest capacity to lead such a global transition. To realize it, however, bold and significant changes are needed. It is of paramount importance to thoroughly assess ASEAN's current condition and make large-scale future-oriented investments to create a sustainable and innovative economic society. Minister Hagiura, pursuing co-creation to grow together with Asian countries, visit ASEAN and hold conversations in person with Indonesia and other ASEAN member states at the critical time. I believe it is crucial for the region's development. Finally, I would like to thank FPCI and MITI again for co-organizing this event and thanks to Karin. I hope all participants actively discuss the key issues of importance and come up with some conclusions for governments, think tanks, and businesses. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Hidetoshi, for the remark. Ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed to the panel discussion, I would like to invite Dr. Dino Patijalal, who is as well going to be the moderator. Without further ado, Dr. Dino, you may have the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you once again to Professor Hidetoshi Nishimura for uh, your remarks. And now we have the pleasure to uh, listen to Minister Koichi Hagiuda, who is Minister for Economy, Trade, and Industry of Japan. Uh, he has been a longtime uh, politician. Um, he, this is his sixth term as a member of parliament, and he represents the 24th district of uh, Tokyo. And prior to this position, Minister Hagiuda was Minister for uh, Youth, uh, Education, uh, Sports, uh, and Technology. Um, of the uh, previous uh, cabinet. So with uh, that said, uh, um, it's a great pleasure to invite Professor Hagiuda to deliver his remarks. Minister. My greetings to you in Indonesia and the ASEAN region. I am Hagiuda Koichi, Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan. It is a great honor for me to deliver my first policy speech overseas from Jakarta. I thank the host, Ambassador Dino Patti Jalal of FPCI and President Nishimura of AREA and others for the organization of this public discussion. 
Japan and ASEAN have been working together as good friends and partners in Asia toward the peace and prosperity of the region. It makes me especially happy that my first place to visit since my appointment is the Southeast Asia, including Indonesia. Though the current pandemic is still impacting hard on our economy and society, it became an opportunity for Japan and ASEAN to reaffirm our bonds founded on a large number of shared interests amongst us. From medical supplies to automobile parts, we fully recognize the need for Japan and ASEAN to work together to make the entire supply chain resilient. On the other hand, the close relationship was demonstrated between Japan and ASEAN mm -hmm. in developing the ASEAN-Japan Economic Resilience Action Plan, which was put together within the short span of four months since the surge of the infection. Our fight against the pandemic is not over. However, the topic I would like to cover today is about the post-pandemic future of the region, especially about the new cooperative relations between Japan and ASEAN in the economic area, with the key words of innovation, sustainability, and co-creation, looking into the future of Asia and Indo-Pacific. First, let me review briefly the development of Japan-ASEAN economic relationship. In olden times, there were centuries of trade exchanges as maritime nations. But our modern economic and industrial exchanges can be traced back in 1960s. This was led by Japanese auto manufacturers who built factories mainly in Thailand first, which was eventually followed by a large number of other Japanese companies who expanded their production bases over ASEAN countries. Currently, more than 14,000 Japanese companies are operating in the ASEAN region. Japan is number one in the cumulative FDI to ASEAN in the manufacturing sector in recent years. However, amount alone will not portray its real value. True contribution of Japan can be found in building industrial foundation and capacity building support, enabling self-sustained growth of each ASEAN country through employees, training, and other manpower investment and nurturing of local businesses, including SMEs. The investment made by companies and grants of ODA in infrastructure development, such as road, rail, industrial parks, etc., worked as the two wheels of a cart to advance economic development of ASEAN countries. We all worked intensively not only in hard connectivity or infrastructure, but also soft connectivity, as in rulemaking, in trade, and investment. Through bilateral EPAs and AJCEP, as well as through market integration of ASEAN, Japan and ASEAN jointly lowered trade barriers and advanced rulemaking in economic activities of the region. The economic relationship between Japan and ASEAN centered around the production network is now changing significantly. One of the key words is innovation, with expanding middle class and large number of young smartphone native population in the ASEAN region. The cases of regional players turning into indigenous innovators are increasing. Outstanding performances of digital tech startup symbolizes a bright future of the region. One more key word is sustainability, addressing climate change and alleviating poverty and securing jobs at the same time is one of the toughest challenges faced by Asia. Also, there are many other outstanding issues such as providing transport infrastructure to go along with urbanization, healthcare access for all, and raising agricultural productivity. Many Japanese businesses have clear recognition of them and strong will to contribute to solving them. In addition to the relations centered around manufacturing, we can become co-creating partners of innovation with expanding Asian consumption market and can aim for sustainable growth paying heed to diverse values. We can broaden fields of joint work from factories to cities and over to the region. New relationship defining Japan ASEAN is already taking shape in the form of private businesses. For Japanese companies, ASEAN is now a partner to innovate and launch businesses together. Time has come for the government to give a big push to open a new chapter for Japan-ASEAN public and private economic relations. There are three important principles. First is realism. Look at the reality of each country in good faith and offer effective solutions to each agenda item. Second is innovation and sustainability. Use private sector's innovation to the maximum extent and create the foundation for sustainable economic society. Third is co-creation of the future. To create the future of the region, working with countries as equal and complementary partners, which can be promoted through the collaboration between Japan and local businesses. 
Together with the Asia Energy Transition Initiative announced last year, these will come into shape together with the Asia Japan Investing for the Future Initiative that I will talk about. To actively make new future-oriented investments so that we can create together with us SEAN an innovative and sustainable economic society. This is the direction that Asia Japan Investing for the Future Initiative is seeking. One of the ideal images of the future of Japan and ASEAN is to improve attractiveness as a global supply chain hub and take the lead in resilient free trade with trust. Another ideal image of the future is Japan and ASEAN who continue to create innovation that enhances sustainability and contributes to solving social issues of the region. To make these futures come true, Japan will strengthen investment in supply chain, connectivity, digital innovation, and human resources. First is investment in supply chain, enhancing ASEAN's capability as an important hub in global supply chain and increasing its attractiveness is extremely important, also from the standpoint of visiting the Japanese economy. Stable and predictable ASEAN attaching importance to free trade and multilateralism offers a high value in an era of uncertainty. Under the pandemic, Japanese government strongly supported the diversification of supply chain of Japanese companies to avoid supply chain disruption. Private sectors are clearly showing their preferences for ASEAN region. We already spent about 300 million US dollars to support capital investment of 92 firms. We plan to continue the support into this year, and as early as this month, new applicants for support will be solicited. Further, investment in digital supply chain management will be promoted. Some advanced cases showed that the disruption risk can be avoided by using data beyond the corporate boundaries. We will select 100 best cases of such with ASEAN and Asian countries. As a first step, Japan will provide about 9 million US dollar support. Also, NEXT Nippon Export and Investment Insurance and JBIC, Japan Bank for International Cooperation, will also provide financial support for enhancing supply chains. Investment will also be made to building supply chain for making new products geared to a changing era. Japanese auto manufacturers are making full-scale effort in exploring local market with possible local production of EVs in sight. For example, in Indonesia and Thailand, various pilot projects such as EV car sharing have started. With these, new market can be found to strengthen local EV production capacity. Japanese government will support market development for next generation vehicles, such as EVs and hydrogen vehicles, and also usage of biofuels. Japan will contribute with public and private together to the development of supply chain of auto industries of ASEAN countries. Second is investment in connectivity. Investment in hard infrastructure will continue, but here I would like to emphasize the soft connectivity. As I mentioned earlier, ASEAN and Japan have been jointly promoting rulemaking through, among others, bilateral and regional FTAs and EPAs. The eagerly awaited entry into force of the RCEP agreement recently took place on New Year's Day. ASEAN has always been in the driver's seat in the RCEP negotiations, and Japan supported this feature all along. It is not an overstatement to say that the RCEP is a symbol of ASEAN centrality as well as ASEAN-Japan partnership. Japan will continue to work toward establishing a free and fair economic order that will ensure that the RCEP will be well functioning as a regional platform, including actively contributing to the steady implementation of the agreement after entry into force. We will contribute to the digitalization of trade procedures as well. Trade documents will be digitalized and digital trade platform will be created where relevant parties can share information comprehensively in a secure way using blockchain technologies. Japan and ASEAN private companies endeavoring to achieve these objectives will be supported by the government. Third is investment into new industry and digital innovation associated with building sustainable society. One Japanese venture company is working with a Malaysian hospital to establish a platform to provide online healthcare services. 
Another Japanese large company is aiming to offer comprehensive healthcare service by partnering with hospitals headquartered in Malaysia to integrate and analyze medical data to offer consultations for early detection of illnesses and preventive medicine, as well as optimum healthcare based on individual patient data. Also, one Japanese venture company developed protein fiber using local agricultural product as a new material, which is made from carbon-free material and established mass production plant in Thailand. Another large company has started consultations with Vietnam on cooperation in the transfer of COVID-19 vaccine production technology. We will support these efforts for new innovation co-creation and help them grow bigger. Japanese government has provided about 8 million US dollars to 40 new projects in the last two years to support alliances of Japanese companies and ASEAN companies offering solutions to local social problems. Moving forward, about 9 million US dollars will be newly provided to promote partnership between Japan and ASEAN businesses. Japan's public-private fund, Japan Investment Corporation, or JIC, with around 2.1 million US dollars or investment capacity, will invest in a Japanese venture capital, which has strength in venture investment in ASEAN. And this will push forward co-creations between ASEAN venture companies and Japanese companies. Fourth, investment in human resources of the future. As mentioned, true contribution of Japanese companies made in ASEAN region had to do with consistent investment in human resources that in turn enabled the setup of industrial foundation and capacity fit for the local needs. There are Japanese auto manufacturers working in human resources development to raise production efficiency of SMEs. There are Japanese freezer manufacturers working in human resource development of regulators to improve safety regulations. Japanese government is supporting such efforts by dispatching experts and providing training in wide areas, such as manufacturing know-how, energy conservation, and cybersecurity. We would like to further extend such initiatives and offer opportunities for ambitious youth. The Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, or MEXT, where I previously took the post of the minister, has enhanced its initiative to have Japanese universities establish degree programs in collaboration with foreign universities. Over the next five years, uh, we would like to extend our support to provide opportunities for ambitious 50,000 highly skilled Asian professionals including graduates under the next initiative to seek jobs in Japanese companies in Asia as well as Japan. With the spirit of co-creation, together with people of ASEAN, we will make all our efforts in investing for the future and make Asia a wealthy region. I would like to touch upon Asia Energy Transition Initiative, or AT. In Asia, including ASEAN, in addition to addressing climate change issues, several difficult issues are reached to be solved at the same time, such as securing stable and affordable energy and realizing sustainable economic growth. As an initiative to support Asia's practical energy transition, Japan announced an initiative called Asia Energy Transition Initiative 80 last year. Many countries in Asia and Middle East strongly supported the initiative. The pathway to achieve Paris Agreement target is not one. AT, with the cooperation of area, is presenting most efficient energy transition roadmap to individual member states of ASEAN, taking into account the circumstances of geographical conditions, economy and energy status of each country. Consultations with each government had already begun. Further, AT will proactively provide 10 billion US dollar finance support and capacity building for technology and projects based on the roadmap for carbon neutrality. This year is implementation year for AT and the first year of Asia energy transition. Based on AT, I would like to drive forward practical energy transition with all of you. First, we will support the promotion of renewable energy and energy management. In policy dialogues with ASEAN countries, Japan will elaborate challenges and necessary support based on Japan's experiences and promote public-private cooperation in the areas of distributed power sources utilizing renewables, 
power grid in light of decarbonization and geothermal power generation. Next is coal firing of ammonia in coal fueled power generation. The world's attention is drawn to how coal power accounted for about 40% of power mix in ASEAN will transition to zero emission. Since last year, Japan is conducting demonstration of 20% coal firing. The goal is to achieve single fuel firing up to 100% by 2030. If coal fueled power can be zero emission, it would make a huge contribution to the world's climate change issue. Last is realizing CCS in ASEAN. Currently at Gundi in Indonesia, feasibility study is underway, a very first CCS project under the joint crediting mechanism. CCS holds a key to decarbonization in Asia. We definitely hope to realize CCS under Japan ASEAN cooperation. Based on AT, we hope Japan and ASEAN can work closely to advance energy transition in Asia. I have covered two initiatives, Asia-Japan Investing for the Future Initiative and Asia Energy Transition Initiative. Through these, Japan will put all its efforts in investing in the future of the region. Asia is becoming the growth center of the world. This future vision wished in the past came true. It's very encouraging for Japan, who is deeply linked to Asia. Investing in Asia's future, including ASEAN, is also investment in Japan's future. Investment in the future of Asia should become investment in the future of the world. To that end, it is essential to build free, open, rule-based, fair, and reliable economic order. I'm convinced that it aligns well with the principles and goals upheld in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. As a country who supports ASEAN centrality, Japan hopes that we can take on leading role in realizing this with ASEAN countries. This year, the presidency of G20 is Indonesia. Next year, G7 presidency will be Japan. In commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the ASEAN-Japan Friendship and Cooperation, it is planned that Prime Minister Kishida will invite ASEAN leaders and hold a commemorative summit in Japan. Through these processes, let us produce maximum synergy in economic policy. I hope the two initiatives I spoke today will be an important driver for such purpose. Today will be a kickoff to start discussion and working with like-minded countries within and outside of the region. I look forward to it very much. Thank you for your attention, Terumakashi. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Hagiuda. That was a very rich, uh, uh speech with lots of uh, policy initiatives uh from uh, japan uh, covering uh, energy uh, supply chain uh connectivity human resources and other important issues that i know will bind asean and japan ever closer uh, together now um and i also highlight the, the the two initiatives that were announced by you uh, which is the uh, Asia-Japan Initiative for the Future, uh, containing very uh, concrete uh, contributions and initiatives by Japan, and also the uh, uh, energy, the ASEAN, uh, uh, Japan ASEAN Energy Transition uh, Initiative, which also contains very, very specific program. And I know it's especially on coal, which I would like to explore further. Uh, so now we come to the discussion stage. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Fukunari Kimura, Chief Economist of uh, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, or ARIA, uh, to give uh, his uh, response. Uh, and then after that, Dr. Nuki Agia Utama, the Executive Director of the ASEAN Center for Energy. Uh, Professor Kimura, uh, what's your response? Please. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Dino. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so it's a great honor for me to be a part of uh, this uh, big conference. Um, we had a very, uh, very concrete and also encouraging speech by His Excellency. Uh, so I'd like to make some supplementary talk by giving uh, three points very quickly, uh, because uh, when we uh, think of uh, the, the future relationship uh, between ASEAN and Japan, I think we have to understand a sort of background to some extent. Uh, next page, please. Uh, sorry, can I, could you share my screen? PowerPoint? 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah next, next please. Yeah, uh, one fourth thing is uh, that uh, actually uh, the globalization didn't die. Uh, we had a, a lot of a pessimistic view on the future of globalization when we got the COVID-19, uh, particularly in uh, Europe and other places in the world. Uh, so many people thought that uh, globalization uh, was unwound, uh, actually going back uh, backward to some extent. Actually, it didn't happen in the case of uh, ASEAN and East Asia. ASEAN and East Asia quickly overcame uh, negative supply shocks and negative demand shocks. Uh, so particularly uh, the, the sophisticated sophisticated portion of global value chains, I call it international production networks, uh, proved to be actually very robust and resilient again. Uh, actually, uh, I, IPNs uh, were very robust and resilient in the past, uh, past uh, crises too, but this time again, uh, it's really coming back very quickly compared with other parts of the economy. Uh, and particularly ASEAN and East Asia aggressively take advantage of uh, uh, sort of positive demand shocks. Actually, we had positive demand shocks uh, uh, due to COVID-19, particularly work at home, stay home type products, including uh, personal computers, dishwashers, uh, uh, and, and uh, say some uh, uh, personal protective equipment too. So, uh, so actually uh, ASEAN and East Asia took advantage of uh, positive demand shocks very aggressively. So that uh, that really help, helped a sort of a, a quick recovery of our exports. Uh, area conducted a questionnaire survey and actually uh, that reveals that uh, many Asian companies are reshuffling uh, their supply chains up, upstream and downstream and gain, gain profits actually. So, so I think uh, we, uh, we observe a very uh, dynamic aspect of uh, Asian firms. Of course, it depends on the sectors. Some sectors are having still a very, very hard time because of COVID-19, uh, but some parts are really uh, gaining actually, so coming from uh, the positive demand shocks. Mm -hmm. so, so although uh, many infection peaks are still coming, uh, ASEAN and East Asia can continue to utilize globalization forces for economic development. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is just uh, the data of, uh, looking at the machinery exports only because the machinery exports are, are a core part of uh, international production networks. Uh, so this is export side by the world to the world and also East Asia to the world, uh, North, North America to the world, uh, Europe to the world. Uh, this is indexed by uh, so, uh, the each, each month of uh, 2019 is equal to one. Uh, COVID-19 provided big shocks. Yes, that's true. Uh, so you can see a sort of a sharp drop uh, in the, the bottom was uh, April or May uh, 2020. Uh, but after that, so coming back very quickly, and if you look at that very, very carefully, the trough was relatively shallow for general and electric machinery and the prestige of machinery. Uh, uh, transport equipment, we had a sort of big drop and still not quite stable, uh, but you can see in other parts of uh, machinery industries, they are coming back very quickly. And particularly in East Asia, you can see that the uh, trough was much shallower and uh, also uh, general and electric machinery, precision machinery did not even have a very sharp drop uh, just after the pandemic started. So uh, then we can see a sort of very strong growth after that. So, uh, so, so in case of uh, uh, transport equipment still not quite stable because of uh, a sort of local lockdowns and also the shortage of uh, semiconductors, uh, but uh, other parts of the machinery industries and international production networks, they are really coming back relatively quickly. So uh, overall, East Asia can still believe in uh, globalization uh, for uh, economic development. So that is uh, quite different from uh, North America and Europe. Uh, next page, please. Uh, yeah, the second point, 
ASEAN is actually a strongly committed to international production networks. Some are worrying about uh, the low uh, intra-ASEAN trade ratios, uh, but uh, if we adjust for uh, the economic size of each country and also distance, uh, then actually ASEAN is really uh, trading, uh, particularly machinery uh, parts and uh, finished products very actively. So we had a relatively simplistic ex economic exercise using so-called gravity equation, uh, a bit technical, but basically uh, using the, the, the trade data for the whole world and get a sort of world average predicted trade values and compared with that uh, predicted values with actual trade uh, in uh, 2019. Then after controlling the country size, distance and others, intra-ASEAN and also ASEAN Northeast Asia links are particularly strong. That is uh, much stronger than North America or Europe. So, Asia, uh, so ASEAN uh, member states start uh, constructing intra-ASEAN production networks. That is including Indonesia. Uh, so ASEAN is at the center of factory Asia actually. Uh, in terms of the value trading values, uh, China is a big one, uh, but the commitment to uh, IPN uh, compared with uh, the economic size, ASEAN is really committed to IPNs. So the US-China confrontation and the geopolitical tension uh, give us a lot of hard time, but at the same time, ASEAN could rather strengthen the importance of ASEAN in factory Asia. So keep, so keep uh, the rule-based trading regime is a very, very important. So, uh, so we have to utilize AEC and also RCEP as living and evolving agreements. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is a this is a, a sort of a, a actual uh, trade values versus predicted trade values. Uh, the rows are exporting countries, uh, columns are importing countries. You can see ASEAN and ASEAN sell uh, 271 percent uh, of export actual exports vis-a-vis -vis predicted values. 2.71 times as large as a trade is observed uh, among ASEAN countries. Uh, so you can see uh, North America, North America, 104%, mm. uh, EU, EU, 117%. Those are much smaller than ASEAN's figures. And also ASEAN is exporting and importing with China, Japan, and uh, Korea. Again, uh, figures are very, very big. So you can, uh, if you see uh, China's figures, China's uh, actual trade values are big, uh, but the commitment to IPN is relatively small compared with ASEAN. So this really look at the sort of, uh, after look, looking at, after controlling ex economic size, ASEAN is really committing to uh, international production networks. So, so we have to continue working on globalization and ASEAN can be uh, really the hub of uh, global value chains. Uh, next, please. Third point, innovation. Uh, in the past two decades, you, we observed that innovation is really shifting rates from uh, incremental innovation to disruptive innovation. Uh, so you can see a sort of a world big companies are all uh, using uh, disruptive innovation rather than uh, incremental innovation. Uh, but things are changing to some extent uh, from uh, 2015 or so. Uh, digital businesses are actually shifting their rates from simple matching businesses by platforms to helping other industries uh, to be uh, re rejuvenated or uh, upgraded. So the connection between digital technology and traditional industries are going to be more and more important now. I think that Japan cannot really uh, uh, grow, grow a big uh, platform as for simple matching, uh, but actually Japan has a lot of accumulation of uh, uh, R&D stock and also incremental innovation. So, so I think uh, the next, in the next generation of uh, uh, digital businesses, uh, a sort of matching between uh, incremental innovation and disruptive innovation uh, is going to be very, very important. So at that stage, Japan can be a very, very important player working with ASEAN. Uh, 
Uh, next, please. So, so I think when we, going back to ASEAN, uh, Japan and ASEAN, uh, one point that I'd like to make is uh, we can still believe in globalization for economic development. So in order to do that, in order to utilize that, uh, the rule-based trading regime and the favorable business environment are essential software. A second point, challenge may become opportunities. COVID-19, geopolitical tension, digital technology, environment and sustainability, those are big challenges for supply chains and our economy. Uh, but we have to make those challenges to be opportunities. Uh, the last point, Japan would like continuous, continuously to be trustable, reliable, and creative partner of ASEAN. So there are a number of issues for further collaboration. Uh, um, Minister Hagiuda mentioned many uh, concrete examples, but so starting from manufacturing with digital innovation, creative sub, uh, services sectors, and also he emphasized education and human resource development, medical and aging society. Certainly uh, Japan can collaborate with ASEAN a lot. And then last, uh, energy environment sustainability. Uh, probably the other panelists will talk about that in detail. So I didn't uh, elaborate on that much, but um, uh, Japan and ASEAN have many common interests uh, in uh, uh, energy transition. So, so I think those are things that we have to talk about a lot. Uh, next, please. Uh, these are references. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Kimura, for your uh, presentation. I now have the pleasure to invite Dr. Nuki Agia Utama, who is the Executive Director of the ASEAN Center for uh, Energy, uh, to give uh, his response uh, in the form of presentation also. And after that, I want, um, uh, I want you to uh, prepare your questions uh, uh, in the chat box, and I will be happy to read them to the panelists. Yeah. Dr. Nuki Utama, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Your Excellency, Dr. Dino Padijara, Your Excellency uh, Koichi Hakiuda, the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, Japan, for these great opportunities, uh, Professor Hidetoshi Mishimura, and also Mr. Afsha Tasir, Chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, before we start, next slide, please. Um, I think it's very good initiative uh, delivered by uh, the Ministry on the uh, ASEAN Energy Transition Initiative, which is a lot of uh, uh, good opportunities for the potential collaboration with Southeast Asia. Uh, before we start on this potential collaboration, uh, Southeast Asia basically have uh, some key strategies under the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation. Uh, we call it in short, API, uh, to promote the energy transition. This API is a great goal energy activities or blueprint energy activities in Southeast Asia, uh, mainly focusing on the uh, ASEAN power grid, which is to expand regional multilateral electricity trading, strengthen the grid resilience as well as modernization, and of course, promoting clean and renewable energy integration. Uh, second uh, program area that we're focusing on is the Trans-ASEAN Gas Pipeline to pursue the development of a common gas market. And the third, also important is the clean coal technology, which is to optimize the role of CCT in facilitating the transition towards sustainable and lower emission uh, development. The fourth program area under apply to see energy efficiency and conservation, which is to reduce uh, expressional target on the energy intensity by 32% uh, in 2025, and also encourage ENC efforts, especially on the transportation sector as well as industrial sectors. Uh, the next program area we, we, uh, we focus on is the renewable energy. Uh, over here, we try to increase the share of RE in the total primary energy supply 33% in 2025, including 35% increase of uh, RE and also VRE in the installed power capacity uh, the same year in 2025. We also have another program area, we call it regional energy policy planning which is to advance energy policy and planning to accelerate the region's energy transition and also resilience. 
And last but not least, we do have uh, program area number seven. We call it the Civilian Nuclear Energy, which, which is to build human resource capabilities on nuclear science and technology for power creation only. Next slide, please. Focusing on the program area number four, which is energy efficiency and conservation, uh, OPS number one and number two on the expand, harmonize, uh, promote EA energy efficiency and focusing on the uh, sectors in the building and transportation sector, as well as industrial sectors. We stated on the OPS number three, OPS number four, and OPS number five, which is to strengthen energy efficiency in the building, pursue energy efficiency in transport, and also advance energy efficiency in the industrial sectors. To achieve 21% uh, to 32% uh, in 2025, and we already achieved 21.8%, in 2019, based on 2005 levels. And under the uh, baseline scenario, based on our study, uh, we call it the ASEAN Energy Outlook 6, it is projected that ASEAN will fall behind the 32% target by 2025. And we need more intensive efforts uh, by promoting the ENC policies, uh, ENC measures, and also application in three sectors, namely buildings, industrial sectors, and also transportation sectors. Next slide, please. Looking on the program area number five, to increase the share of RE, 23% in total primary, primary energy supply and 35% in installed power capacity in 2025. We have a six outcome-based strategies, which is uh, uh, to expand RE policy and decarbonization pathway, also to promote RE financing schemes and also mechanism and also supporting biofuel and bio energy development, as well as enhancing our information and training center. The RE share in total primary energy in 2019 was 13.9, an increase of 0.04% uh, from 2018. And while it's on the installed power capacity in 2019 is 28.7%. I think we have to uh, uh, work a bit harder to increase the 35% installed power capacity in 2025. And the plant capacity addition are more on coal, around 38.5 gigawatt, followed by natural gas power plants, around 6.4 gigawatt, gigawatt by 2025. And also, on the other hand, the region is expected to add RE uh, in, uh, around 16.7 gigawatt in the same year, which is 2025. Uh, more efforts are needed to increase this RE share puts on the total installed cap power capacity as well as from a total uh, primary energy uh, supply. So both three scenarios we developed under the ASEAN Energy Auto 6 uh, last year launched during the ministerial uh, meeting. Next slide. Move on the energy transition opportunities and challenges. We do have a huge uh, uh, opportunities, a huge potential, huge threshold of, uh, of uh, indigenous energy and the primary energy uh, supply. And then based on our study called the Asset Collection Master Plan Study Tree, uh, we identify 40 solar sites around 66 gigawatt and also uh, 20 wind uh, sites potential, which is uh, 8 gigawatt, as a potential location to connect with the X16 grid lines to the ASEAN power grid. So those aim study are um, uh, looking at the potential for 10 member states to be collected into one power grid uh, uh, from Vietnam to Philippines, also from Vietnam to uh, Indonesia, to uh, Peninsula, uh, Singapore, as well as Sumatra and Java. Uh, and then to reach the APEC target, uh, two further action must be integrated. First is the upscaling current RE and energy efficiency, and of course, energy intensity effort. And uh, together with the efficiency technology deployment. So, technology is a uh, very important keywords on uh, the future of um, looking at the opportunities on energy transition in Southeast Asia. If you're looking at those RE potential as well as energy efficiency uh, potential. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing on the opportunities is the uh, in the energy transition is the uh, abundant resource to develop indigenous hydrogen production, uh, green hydrogen, blue or green, uh, uh, hydrogen production. Uh, also combined cost of hydrogen and, uh, uh, and FCEF, uh, electricity vehicles decline rapidly. And we have a relevant infrastructure, which is gas pipeline and LNG liquefaction plants, 
coupling RE and hydrogen as a future clean energy supply and energy storage as well. So we're looking at the potential of uh, hydrogen, not only for supplying the uh, energy, but also as a storage. And of course, it will creating a sustainable road as transportation. Uh, looking at the other potential is the CCS, which is cost around 18 to 46% of total hydrogen supply cost, depending on the desired percentage of total carbon emission to be avoided. Uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam have around 54 gigaton of geological storage. And then the opportunity to develop CCS hub and value added of CCUS from uh, enhanced oil recovery uh, application. And hydrogen projects started emerging in Southeast Asia, as you're looking at over here. Pearl Jerusalem is exporting hydrogen to Japan, already started. Singapore will trial hydrogen for ships. Uh, Malaysia's Petronas that steps up investment in hydrogen as part of the carbon free energy goals. Next slide. Despite the impact of COVID-19 pandemics, high share of unaffected fossil fuel in the energy system and lack of our investment remain the main challenges of the all energy transition in Southeast Asia. And then uh, the RE investment is still low in comparison of the investment from the fossil uh, fuel. And based on the six ASEAN energy outlook, the energy supply in the region is still dominated by fossil fuel, which is, will continue up to 2040. The low cost of fossils in the main drive is the main driver of the fossil domination to secure the rapid economic growth in the region. And the replacement and improvement of uh, in fossil fuel technologies are required to minimize the emission and also minimize the cost in the energy. Uh, next slide. Please. Additional financing is needed to shift current plan of coal fire uh, power plants to high efficiency, low emission or heavy technology, and of course, possibilities on the CCUS implementation. It is a showing that uh, from the current mix per current pipeline, uh, and, uh, we need approximately, if you're looking at the current trend and current plan in the uh, 10 member states, we required uh, around 139.1 billion US dollars. Well, if we shift all of those into the ultra super critical, it required more, which is around 147.8 billion. Approximately, we need around 8.7 billion US dollars or increasing around 6.2 in comparison with the uh, baseline uh, scenarios. So this additional financing in, in my opinion, is a relatively low in comparison or with the required amount of investment in per ton carbon dioxide emission reduction. In this case, the shifting from uh, all uh, subcritical to what uh, USC or ultra supercritical uh, required around 7.4 US dollars per ton carbon dioxide. Well, if you're looking at the potential, if we change, for example, by using gasoline tax, uh, required uh, investment is around 18 to 47 US dollar. Uh, if we move again on the methane uh, flaring, for example, we need uh, around 20 US dollar per ton. And again, if you move on the dedicated uh, rate for the electricity of vehicles, even higher, which is around 350 to 640 US dollar per ton. And if we also move over, uh, all of those into the PV with subsidies, even uh, uh, the, the risk even more wider, which is around 140 to 2,100 US dollar per ton. So uh, this era of energy transition, meaning that coal will continue as, as a substantial role as a base load, dispatchable as well as, well as a resilient a power source for a balanced energy mix to ensure energy security and also energy affordability. Moreover, to accommodate intermittent energy source, our coal can ramp power as needed to provide essential grid stabilizing uh, services. And heavy technology is one of the uh, good option and very reason, uh, 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 reasonable choices, especially if we combine with CCUS, which is uh, represent a significant progress on the transition uh, pathway towards low carbon economy in the region. Next slide. Next slide, please. yeah. If you're looking at uh, towards low carbon in the total primary energy sequest, whereas power generation, uh, based on the our uh, scenario uh, comparison 
on the baseline in comparison with the ASEAN plan of action uh, scenarios. Uh, we have a possibilities to reduce in some sectors, for example, oil and gas sectors, we can reduce uh, quite significantly uh, around uh, uh, 222 million ton of carbon dioxide uh, equivalents. And the empower sector itself can be more than 255 uh, million ton carbon dioxide equivalent, while on the uh, transportation sector is also quite a lot, which is 153 uh, a million ton carbon dioxide equivalent. So basically, the emission reduction between baseline and APS scenarios, uh, the best of, which is the best available scenarios in Southeast Asia. Uh, can only decrease approximately 527 million ton of equivalent, uh, million ton carbon dioxide equivalent by 2025. Next slide, please. So back on this IT potential collaboration, uh, I stated uh, in the beginning, there are plenty of potential collaboration on these IT activities with Southeast Asia or ASEAN. Uh, first is the, is the ASEAN Energy Transition Roadmap. Uh, which is the regional roadmap of energy transition has to be uh, has not been existed right now and with the support of IT uh, we could also develop the roadmap that, ex, uh, that assist the each member state to meet their energy transition target second uh, financing support on RE energy efficiency and also LNG which is uh, the lack of financing uh, support is the main uh, challenges in the region uh, third is development and deployment Supports on hydrogen, CCUS, as well as energy storage. Uh, and then uh, the fourth is the capacity building on decarbonization technologies for ASEAN expert and policy uh, makers. So those are uh, four uh, potential collaboration, which is currently we have in mind uh, for further collaboration with uh, IP uh, or ASEAN Energy Transition Initiative that uh, previously uh, announced by the uh, ministers. Next slide. And yet, we do have a current cooperation with Japan under the RPI Phase 2, 2021-2025, uh, such as the oil stockpiling roadmap, or ISRM with JOCMAC. And also, we have a JCO strategic report on the role of uh, coal-fired power plant in the era of energy transition. We have also collaborative work with ECCJ on the energy efficiency and conservation. Next slide. On the ACE ASEC JAI promotion of higher efficiency or air conditioner in ASEAN through harmonization of standards and strengthening of market verification and enforcement capabilities. This one is quite interesting uh, studies on validation on the cooling system in the region. And also, uh, the upcoming activities are currently we started is the Cleaner Energy Future in Initiative for ASEAN or SAFIA, which is to facilitate collaboration between. Uh, public and private sectors for accelerating the development and deployment of cleaner energy and low carbon technologies in ASEAN past three countries. And then also is IEC and GIA practical training on technology for nuclear non-proliferation uh, in the region, which is to enhance and improve knowledge, capabilities, and also public awareness of nuclear energy in the region. Next slide. And, uh, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia also working together with ASEAN Pass 3, uh, which is Korea, China uh, included, uh, on the policy governing group or EPGG on the ASEAN Pass Energy Security Forum. We discussing on the Energy Security Forum, energy security on oil and gas, energy security on coal, energy security on nuclear, and also energy safety management. On the market and natural gas forum, oil market and natural gas forum business dialogue, while it's on the uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency conservation forum, we have uh, plenty also activities on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the collaborative work with the ASEAN Plus Three, and then ASEAN Plus Clean Energy Roundtable Dialogue, such as Clean Energy Roundtable Dialogue, ASEAN China Plus Building Program, and also joint studies with some uh, uh, member state Plus Three uh, in the region. Next slide. Uh, thank you very much for these opportunities. I think uh, we can continue with the discussion at the front in particular, your Excellency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nuki. Uh, 
for your uh, presentation now. Uh, I would be pleased to take some questions from the chat. Um, anyone who wants to ask questions, please uh, write your questions in the chat box. I have the first question from Satrio Santoso from the Ateneo de Davao, Philippines. Uh, to all panelists, uh, what's your view towards the future, future ties between Japan and ASEAN countries, especially Indonesia? Noting that there's an ongoing issue regarding coal export ban from Indonesia. Will this affect the relationship between Indonesia and Japan? Does anyone want to answer this? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not really following very in detail for the case, but I understand that uh, uh, probably due to the high, high, high pr world prices of coal, uh, so, um, uh, some some are really exporting coal from uh, Indonesia a lot, and then uh, there's a possible shortage of uh, coal inside Indonesia. Uh, so that's why uh, a possibility of uh, a ban on uh, uh, coal exports, at least uh, temporarily, that's that's my to my understanding. And, and I think the Japanese government is uh, asking Indonesia to reconsider and thinking of the situation a little bit more carefully. Uh, yeah, uh, one, one thing is uh, certainly uh, a sort of a responsibility of exporters uh, that, that would happen sometimes uh, when wild prices are uh, getting a, a big hike. Uh, we, we experienced that uh, in uh, rice prices and others in the past, and uh, possibly now for energy prices. So, so I think uh, we have, yeah, if uh, you, you would, uh, provide uh, export bans and uh, also other other countries would follow, uh, then we would have even higher energy prices. Mm -hmm. so, so I think uh, somehow we have to think of some balance. I understand that the energy prices are sometimes very political sensitive in Indonesia, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, we have to have some sort of balanced solution uh, due to these kind of things. Yeah, that, that's my opinion so far. Dr. Nuka, you want anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, I think a very, uh, very good question in regard to this um, uh, export ban on the uh, coal. Uh, this is one of the uh, issues on the energy uh, securities uh, where uh, the region itself is, is really uh, a part of the uh, global uh, supply chain. And I will be looking at the, uh, the current status uh, when uh, if we, for, for example, we assuming that the current production remain uh, the same while the consumption increases, we are going to be the net importers of coal in the next uh, 20 uh, years. And also we are going to be the net importers of gas in the next seven to 10 years. If we cannot find a new um, uh, quarry or new uh, uh, source of uh, those uh, primary energy. Uh, so it is quite interesting for us to look at the bigger perspective, not only uh, the, 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 the current condition we have, but this current condition is like uh, the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, some kind of reminder for us that we have to looking at on the whole perspective of energy supply, energy security, on the energy supply perspective, uh, for example, in, in Indonesia itself, 60% is, uh, you know, rely on coal. So in terms of energy security, that's not really, um, uh, you know, uh, secure enough. Uh, in, in also in Southeast Asia, uh, the, the, the share of the, of the uh, you know, the, uh, the power mix as well as a primary energy mixture is not also uh, balanced in that way. So, uh, uh, Somehow we need to talk and discuss together on how we can make it a balance, uh, uh, make sure that we are going to really secure uh, enough in the next 20, 30 years uh, regionally and also beyond Southeast Asia as, 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 as uh, ASEAN is part of the uh, global supply chain as well. I think that's sort of my, uh, my response. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Kimura. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm reading uh, the text of what uh, Minister Hagiuda said and he described the world economic order uh, as uh, needing to be free, open, rules-based, fair, and reliable, right? Uh, of course, I've heard about uh, free and open and rules-based. 
but uh, I was wondering, what is your take on what he has in mind when he talks about a fair and reliable economic order? Yeah, what, what's at the back of his mind? Yeah, basically, uh, trade and economic activities should be free and reliable too. So in order to have that suddenly rule-based trading regime, this is extremely important. Uh, but at the same time, uh, so we can see uh, some uh, policy uh, policy risks sometimes. Uh, probably uh, the export ban is one of them. Uh, so we, we observe that uh, in, in the pandemic too, actually, uh, actually for uh, uh, personal protective equipment and the essential goods, uh, we have to have some uh, reliable uh, e economic infrastructure. Otherwise, uh, we cannot we, we would have a sort of a big shrink of our economic activities. So uh, we have uh, many difficulties now, uh, say uh, energy prices are going up and downs. Uh, we, we had the COVID-19, we had geopolitical tension, but the, we really have to defend uh, the rule-based trading regime. Uh, that, that was a really basic infrastructure of the prosperity of ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, that's what he meant, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, particularly in case of Japan, uh, we are really having uh, in a very uh, enhancing geopolitical tension right now. So, one side of the people uh, call for a uh, sort of a managed trade rather than a sort of a free trade, actually. So, mm -hmm. so I think you, uh, I'm not sure ASEAN people had uh, that kind of pressure now or not, but uh, in Northeast Asia, actually, that kind of movement is there too. So, mm -hmm. so certainly we have to have some export control and uh, other things uh, if uh, this is really needed, uh, but we really have to keep the keep the room for rule-based trading regime as wide as possible. Uh, in order to do that, we really have to work with ASEAN people very closely. Yes, yeah. You know, I ask you this because fair is a loaded term, yeah? What's fair for one country yeah. may not be fair to, to uh, other countries. And there's also a part in his speech that uh, caught my eye. Uh, he said <coughs> about coal that uh, Japan's goal is to achieve <coughs> single fuel firing up to 100% by 2030. And then he said, if coal fuel power can be zero emission, again, if coal fuel power can be zero emission, it would make a huge contribution to climate change. So I, I'm just wondering if uh, either you or uh, Nuka can, can uh, just elaborate more on, on the, you know, the possibility that uh, uh, coal power can be zero uh, emission because uh, you know uh, we don't hear much about that concept. Yeah, that's do Dr. Nuki's uh, specialty, I guess. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, certainly technically possible, but uh, now very expensive. That's a problem. So so we need mm -hmm. some technical advancement to uh, reduce the cost somehow. So that's a sort of balance so far. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that's that's my understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Noka, you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, um, perhaps we have to consider really on the, the high CC low emission uh, together with the CCS or CCUS. Uh, that's uh, perhaps something that um, uh, uh, can be achieved on uh, making that uh, the emission from coal is uh, really uh, close to zero. I don't know whether it's really zero because none of Technology can be really uh, zero because PV itself also the production is emitting some carbon dioxide. But those, those are the potential uh, on the emission reduction if we're looking at the coal perspective. And if it is indeed uh, um, affordable enough, the prices uh, you know uh, can compare to other uh, technologies. Again, meaning that it is uh, quite promising uh, things to do. Uh, since uh, with the USC, we have the CCUS, as I also stated during my presentation, the cost per ton carbon dioxide is somehow uh, quite uh, low in comparison with the, for example, methane flaring and, or even the PV with the subsidies uh, is relatively uh, low. So, so we can we can looking at on those uh, potential. But again, in my opinion, in regard to that's in regard with energy affordability, or, uh, or say, but if you're looking at the energy security, it may be a bit different story. We really 100% rely on coal, that's uh, sort of uh, quite um, not 
uh, secure enough in terms of the supply of the energy. So in my opinion, uh, we have to really make a balance on this fossil fuel, non-fossil fuel, even the non-fossil fuel or RE, it should be also uh, equally uh, distributed uh, to make sure the, 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 the supply is there and also stability in the freedom of the grid. And again, the cost will be uh, one of the key messages uh, on the region to really go ahead on the uh, achievement of the uh, economic uh, growth uh, in the next 20 years or 30 years. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Jakarta Post uh, from Vincent, and this is addressed to Mr. Uh, Fukunari. Uh, he asks, Indonesia also plans to expand export bans to other minerals like bauxite, tin, copper, and other minerals in 2022. How would this affect Japan's economy? And according to the World Bank, Japan is the second largest mineral export market for Indonesia. Yeah, uh, that, that could be a very serious issue, certainly. Uh, so particularly uh, whether or not we can have Indonesia as a very good trading partner. So, so I think uh, we have to have uh, so a free trade, uh, think, think much of a market mechanism to, uh, to, uh, as, as far as possible. Uh, I think that would be very important. Hmm. Okay. Um... This is also a, a question, actually, this is from a, a big name, uh, Imam Pambakyo, who is the chief negotiator for RCEP. Uh, he asks, how can ASEAN and Japan promote a broader base of economic and trade cooperation in greater East Asia? We can talk about deepening regional value chain between ASEAN and Japan in many aspects, but it's not the end of it. We need participation of other countries and region in the value chain. And in time of illiberalization, deglobalization, distress of multilateral trading system and rise of uh, new mercantilism, uh, adoption of trade coercion and so on. Is it possible for ASEAN and Japan to work together to rebuild confidence in rules-based free trade and investment? Very interesting question from Chief Negotiator of uh, RCEP, Imam Pabagyo. Uh, response? Uh, th thank you, uh, Pak Iman. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, I think, uh, um, yeah, now, now we are having a very big pressure from a geopolitical tension, uh, a sort of enhancement of policy risks and the pressure for managed trade. So we really have to defend a uh, rule-based trading regime uh, as far as possible. So, so certainly one thing is that the risk, uh, we have to continue working on a WTO reform it's very difficult to do, but certainly we have to cooperate with that. And also now we have RCEP and also some, some countries are having a CPTPP uh, in addition to uh, AEC. So, so I think uh, we have to utilize those uh, mega FTAs as a really living and uh, evolving uh, agreements to uh, defend on uh, uh, rule-based trading regime. And also the expansion of the membership and others, uh, that is also very, very important too. So, so I think uh, uh, now we are really uh, having a sort of a smaller and smaller uh, territory for the rule-based trading regime. We really have to defend on that. That's um, my, my feeling these days. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nuka, let me ask you this question. Uh, Minister Hag Yuda uh, you know, explained about uh, the Japanese policy initiative to help uh, the energy uh, transition in, in Asia. Do you think after COP26 recently in, Sc in Scotland, uh, Southeast Asian countries are embracing a much more progressive and bold uh, climate uh, policies, uh, especially on, on renewable uh, do you see that political win gaining ground uh, in Southeast Asia? Uh, yes, um, thank you. Uh, uh, in fact, in uh, last year, 2020, 2021, um, approximately the all install power capacity that we, Southeast Asia, uh, install. 80% uh, out of it is coming from the renewable energy, and mainly uh, goes to Vietnam, around uh, 19 uh, gigawatt, if I'm not mistaken. So basically, before COP26, uh, this region already tried to uh, proceed and expand, increasing the share of RE, including VRE, into their uh, grid, mainly. Uh, also, on the, uh, power, uh, also on the uh, primary energy supply, 
Uh, the activities are increasing the share from RE also there. Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia itself try to increase the share of the of the uh, biofuel into the fuel on the charcoal transit sector is quite significantly. Uh, Indonesia plan to have it be 100, uh, Thailand also be 2030, Malaysia as well. So those are a very interesting uh, uh, policies uh, direction that need to be really being captured by the, by the member states in Southeast Asia because we do have a big market and we have a lot of resource uh, on that sense. Thank yeah, you. but Indonesia has not. Indonesia has been the exception to to that trend, don't you think? Because uh, Indonesia renewable energy is still far below the twenty three percent target uh, for twenty twenty five, and investment in renewable energy and government policies has really not been keeping up with the uh, worldwide trends. Uh, would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, if you're looking at um, country specific, which is Indonesia, yes, we do have some challenges on the regulation and also um, some, some other cross-sectoral issues. Uh, I think Indonesia need to talk in, in the matters of uh, uh, cross-sectoral, uh, the, 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 the Pertamina and also PI need to talk about the, how the uh, RE and PI need to be increased. And uh, uh, I mean, one institution cannot only, uh, you know, uh, 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 plan only on, on their own perspective. Uh, we have to really combine the whole perspective on the, on the uh, for example, if you're looking at EV, we have to looking at the potential of bioenergy energy, bio fuel from the Protamina point of view. Uh, we cannot only go ahead in, in one direction. So we have to have a holistic perspective. Uh, then also ASDM, uh, MEMR have to have a uh, good uh, regulation to accommodate uh, those uh, potential and also uh, those uh, target in 2025 at least. Yeah, uh, Professor Kimura, uh... Minister Hagiuda mentioned about uh, that uh, IAT will proactively provide $10 billion of finance support and capacity building for technology and project based on uh, the roadmap for carbon uh, neutrality. Uh, am I correct in assuming that uh, this is part of the post Glasgow uh, commitment of developed countries uh, trying to provide $100 billion of climate financing. So, so I'm, I'm imagining this is part of it. Uh, am I right? And then also, is that $10 billion uh, meant for Southeast Asia or for globally? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know the answer to that, but uh, maybe- Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's what I don't know exactly. Yeah, but certainly mm -hmm. that is a part of our plan to achieve a, a carbon neutrality by 2050. So that, that's a commitment. And the details are really actually uh, right now are really uh, looking at. Uh, so uh, this is just a part of the big program. That, that, that's what I understand. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but am I correct in assuming that Japan considers itself a, a, a leading country uh, on, on climate diplomacy and climate economics? Now it's going to be a really, really big topic. Uh, we cannot really avoid that. Yes. Uh, but and, uh, uh, but um, Japan itself, is having a really, really uh, difficult situation to some extent. We are really using a fossil fuel a lot too. So, so even if we stop using coal, still we are using gas and others a lot too. So, so uh, th there's a, a sort of big pressure and then uh, really the whole energy uh, policy is now re remaked, re remade actually. Uh, that, mm. That's a process right now in Japan. But, but you also imagine that uh, Japan car companies, uh, Toyota, uh, Mitsubishi, uh, and, and all the others, uh, will be uh, a, a leading companies uh, for EV. Uh, because in Indonesia, uh, you know, uh, the, the government is going to be big on, on uh, EV production. Uh, yeah, and it yeah, aims so to be, uh, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right. Uh, Nissan and others are already doing uh, to some extent. And, but uh, and now, now Toyota announced uh, sort of a big shift uh, by themselves too, actually. So, so it's going to be changing uh, very rapidly, uh, shifting to uh, mm. some sort of EV. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have, I think I'm, I've been told that uh, this is going to be the, the last question. There's a question from Awina Ivan uh, to, again, Professor Kimura. Uh, what should be Japanese government's response to the increasingly aggressive approach from China and Korea to disrupt supply chain for various sectors in ASEAN, especially Indonesia? 
yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, um, the whole supply chains are still there. So, but uh, so, uh, for some really sensitive sectors and others, we are having uh, a sort of partial decoupling right now. And also uh, we, we have to avoid the policy risks uh, from uh, partially from the China side, possibly, uh, possibly from the US side, actually. Uh, so we have to uh, prepare for possible uh, uh, policy risks too. So, so in that sense, actually, uh, particularly the relationship with ASEAN is uh, going to be more important in that kind of environment. Uh, we'd like to have a sort of really stable, reliable relationship uh, in supply chain management. Mm, okay. Uh, you know, finally, uh, I'm, this is a question for me uh, to both of you. Uh, I, I mentioned to you earlier that, you know, what I remember about Japan is, you know, Godzilla, Sony, and 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 and, and Toyota, right? Uh, and uh, you know, that was the time when when Japan really was uh, like the biggest picture in, in uh, investment and, and manufacturing uh, industries uh, in, in Indonesia and in the region. Uh, but now uh, the, the landscape is quite different, right? Uh, Chinese uh, investment, uh, Chinese capital is really coming into the region uh, big time uh, and also Chinese trade, right? Uh, Samsung is very popular uh, in, in uh, Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Uh, you, you have other competitors. Uh, I, I think it, it's safe to be said that Samsung is much more popular than Sony, for example, right? Uh, which uh, I hardly see now uh, in department stores, right? But, I have, I have uh, one, one uh, smartphone too, actually. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. So, so I, maybe my question to you is: uh, If you look at uh, Japan's economic engagement uh, in in the region in the next uh, 10, 20 years or so, uh, what would uh, separate Japanese uh, uh, economic engagement uh, uh, compared to U.S., uh, Chinese, uh, Singaporean, or Korean? Uh, uh, economic uh, e engagement. Yeah. So, so what would make Japan unique relative to those other uh, uh, countries? Yeah, uh, yeah we, we, have, we have a big discussion on why uh, Japan's economic growth is so slow for a long, long time. Uh, but it's, uh, one thing is in the past 20 years or so, uh, we did not really make a sort of a good, uh, good engagement in the digital technology and traditional industries, including uh, manufacturing sector. So certainly we have to build up that kind of uh, innovation system somehow uh, quickly. Otherwise, uh, that, that, that has sort of big problem. But we have a really big uh, R&D stock, actually. So uh, particularly based on the gradual innovation, uh, incremental innovation, we had a lot of stock. We really have to utilize that somehow effectively. And that would be a sort of a good, uh, good thing for uh, neighboring countries, including ASEAN too, uh, because in ASEAN, particularly uh, population is young and also uh, you have a very good entrepreneurship. Uh, we really have to think of a sort of matching between our R&D stock and uh, young entrepreneurs uh, in, in ASEAN and other parts of the world. So, so I think uh, 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 from the, from the viewpoint of our, our private companies, we have uh, many things that we really have to do. And, uh, as, a, as a government, uh, so uh, as, as, as I said again and again, I think a rule-based trading regime should be defended somehow. Uh, that's, that's a government's job. So we have, in that sense, we have to have a good foreign relationship, particularly with ASEAN. So that, that's what probably we can do. And then uh, at least we like to be reliable and credible a partner for ASEAN. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I, I agree with you that I think the term quality investment really applies to Japanese uh, because that, that's really part of the Japanese uh, investment uh, DNA. And, you know, when I was in government, I dealt uh, quite a bit with Japanese uh, as well. And I think the, 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 the thinking, the perception is always that Japanese are tough negotiators. When you deal with uh, Japanese uh, companies, for example, uh, or government, uh, the negotiations are really tough, but once it is uh, final, then the implementation is, is always uh, assured. Uh, uh, the, the commitment is always uh, uh, guaranteed and, and, and safe. Yeah. So, so I think that's what we really appreciate about the Japanese uh, investments 
in, in Indonesia and also in the region. So, uh, and then Pa uh, Nuki, uh, any closing words uh, from you before I give it to the moderator? Yes. To the MC, I mean, sir. Yeah, thank you. I think this uh, potential collaboration and existing collaboration is already one of the biggest in the region. If you're looking at the activities, uh, as I also stated in the previous presentation, uh, uh, Japanese also have uh, provided a lot of assistance to, to us on the energy efficiency as well as the renewable energy. And uh, looking at the potential in the future, there will be some uh, room for uh, more uh, collaboration, for example, like hydrogen, CCUS, energy storage, and also, of course, the uh, heli technology and uh, nuclear power, perhaps in the future. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm coughing a lot, but I promise you, I don't have COVID. I, I, did, I was PCR today <laughs> and yesterday. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody uh, uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, discussion. And I think uh, I would urge everybody to read into the lines of um, Minister Hagiuda's speech. Uh, I, I thought it was very interesting speech. Uh, you know, he didn't mention a lot of rhetorics, you know, uh, a lot of flowery uh, messaging, you know, uh, a, a lot of it is really concrete stuff uh, with uh, concrete uh, proposals on, on, on the table and what they intend to do, not 50 years from now, but uh, in the coming years, right? So, so I thought that was very, interesting uh, speech and uh, let's hope that it will be implemented uh, soon and implemented effectively. I now have the pleasure to give the microphone back to the MC. Thank you, Dr. Dino for moderating the session. Once again, we would like to thank His Excellency Koichi Hagyuda, Professor Fukunari Kimura, and also Dr. Nuki Agia Utama for participating and for your important insights. We had almost 600 participants tuning in to our discussion from both Zoom and also our YouTube channel. It has been a fruitful discussion and I'm sure the audience found the session really informative. For everyone's information, today's event is available for rewatch on FPCI official YouTube channel at Secretariat FPCI. Ladies and gentlemen, so that was all for our public discussion today. You can follow our social media handles for more information about our activities and upcoming events and also programs via Instagram or Twitter at FPC Indo. Thank you everyone for tuning in. See you.